Welcome to Aging Insights. I'm Melissa Chalker, Program Manager of the New Jersey Foundation for Aging. Aging Insights is produced by the New Jersey Foundation for Aging to provide information and resources to boomers, seniors, and caregivers. The New Jersey Foundation for Aging's mission is to enable seniors to live with independence and dignity in their communities. Everyone has a favorite style of music or artist, a song that sparks a memory or makes you feel good. But did you know that music is actually good for you and that some professionals are using music in a therapeutic manner? We have three fantastic and very knowledgeable guests with us today. Marianne Ross of UMDNJ's COPSA Institute for Alzheimer's Disease and Related Disorders. Karen Kowalski of UMDNJ's Department of Psychiatric Rehabilitation and Counseling Professions Occupational Therapy Assistant Program. And Edie Elkins, Founding Director of Bedside Harp. Welcome, ladies. Thank you so much for uh, making time available to join us today for this exciting uh, program. Uh, Marianne, I did want to start with you and mm -hmm. go over some of the things that COPES has been doing in relation to this topic. Uh, and now you work with um, dementia-related things. Could you tell us a little bit more about what COPSA is? Sure. Um, COPSA is a center at the um, University of Medicine and Dentistry, the University of Behavioral Health Care, soon to be Rutgers University of Behavioral Health Care, yes. for the diagnosis and treatment of dementing illnesses. And we offer a continuum of services. Um, if someone has some concerns about uh, a person having memory problems, they can mm -hmm. call our helpline okay. and talk to a social worker. Um, families can bring someone with memory problems to our memory disorder clinic. Mm -hmm. And if they're having behavioral problems, they can bring them. And what we do is we work with both the patient and the family. We yes. also have a wide a variety of support groups. We have okay. a support group for young wives. That's people who are caring for someone who has a dementia in their 40s or 50s. So early onset. Mm -hmm. We have, through the county, we have a special caregivers program for all kinds of caregivers, not just dementia caregivers. And we have a program that's called Just for the Fellas. It's for men who are caring okay. for their wives. Well, that's a unique um, subset of, of caregivers, and so it's great that you're able to provide right. them their own support group in, in their own way. Oh, yeah, it's they have a special for... set of needs, really. Sure, sure, sure. And then I guess the way that we use music or the way that, it, that we see the advantage of music the most is with our Dementia Day program because they use that to work with people who have a dementia. Um, I guess what's really interesting now is that uh, researchers are validating what poets and musicians and music lovers have been saying for years, that music has a real big impact on our mood and our bodies. It's called the um, drug with no side effects. Drug with no side effects. Mm -hmm. I like that. Because it can improve <laughs> sleep. It can mm -hmm. um, lower blood pressure and anxiety and improve depression. Wow. And with dementia patients, especially for someone who's at home who's caring for someone with dementia, um, it can set the mood for the person. If they play music that they like, it can uh, reduce behavioral problems mm -hmm. and put the person in a better mood, a little more relaxed, a little more comfortable. Sure. So it's really important. Yeah, it does sound uh, very important. And so just the idea of, of playing music, um, mm -hmm. you know, whether it's a recording or live music, um, and especially it sounds like if it's something that is familiar to the person, mm -hmm. it's most helpful to them because it may, uh, as I said in the intro, spark a memory or it may oh, take definitely. them back to another time. Yeah, a good time. Mm -hmm. Sure. It makes, I could see how that would lift up one's mood uh, in that instance. Uh, in what ways would you recommend that people could try this at home, uh, you know, if they are caring? giving at home and, and are finding that their loved one might need uh, a pick-me-up uh, in that way. Well, I think what's great about music is that it's it can be individualized mm -hmm. to what the person likes. I think that, you know, it's something that we take for granted, but if you consciously try to use it as a tool for a specific reason, mm -hmm. then what you can do is decide what you want to use it for. Do Does my loved one get upset around 4 o'clock in the afternoon? Mm -hmm. Do they start to sundown? Sure. Let me see if I play this song, um, if we listen to this show tune, or whatever it is that they liked, mm -hmm. whether it's the blues, whatever music, right. music from the 40s, if that changes their mood. So mm -hmm. it's going to be a matter of developing it yourself and developing an individualized um, 
program of music for that person. For that person, sure. Mm -hmm. uh, do you find in any of the studies or have in your experience um, that it helps with sleep at all to listen oh, to Oh, definitely. Music? In fact, there's studies that show that people who use music for sleep actually sleep better have wow. a deeper sleep, a better quality of sleep. You know, they did uh, progressive relaxation exercises, mm -hmm. and they did it with music and without, and the people who did it with music slept much better. Right. And uh, for our audience who might not know what progressive relaxation is, could you just expand on that a little bit? Well, what it is is um, gradually uh, becoming more and relaxed, relaxing different portions of your body, mm -hmm. um, from your feet up to your head, right. and, and relaxing one step at a time. Right, and it's usually accompanied by a voice you listen to a recording you that's telling you to. You can listen to a recording. You can mm -hmm. do it yourself. Mm -hmm. It's almost like a meditation right. type of thing. Great. Yeah. And do you have any tips uh, for seniors on how they can use music uh, towards a healthy aging? Well, I think that um, if they're interested in feeling better, music can play a powerful role in that. Um, if they're depressed or anxious, music can help. Mm -hmm. um, I wouldn't recommend anyone throw away antidepressants mm -hmm. or any kind of medication. Sure. We're, not, we're not saying replace everything. No, replace it, but just <laughs> as an adjunct, mm -hmm. it really can have a very positive impact. And it's something that you don't think about, mm -hmm. but it's something that really can work. Mm -hmm. So I think it's really important to try. Great. Well, thank you for sharing all of that You're with welcome. us. We really appreciate it. Um, certainly, you know, you've mentioned that music is powerful, and we know that that's very true. And it's also powerful not only when you listen to music, but also when you play music. Uh, and so, uh, moving on uh, to Karen, uh, in speaking with you about your experience, you do use music uh, in your work, and I think you use it in a couple different ways. Do you want to tell us about that's that? That's true. Well, <laughs> in addition to being an occupational therapist and faculty member at UMDNJ for the OTA program, um, for the past 15 years, I've been teaching piano to individuals who are looked upon as a little bit more challenging for other mm -hmm. music teachers to mm -hmm. teach. Um, so, for example, I teach um, individuals who might have had, um, you know, might have had uh, cerebral palsy, muscular dystrophy, mm -hmm. autism, mm -hmm. Down syndrome, mm -hmm. um, you know, partial amputation, a stroke. Um, you know, but also, um, you know, considering the, the adult and older adult, mm -hmm. you know, those people who might be having some, you know, some cognitive decline, mm -hmm. you know, due mm -hmm. to aging, or those who might say, you know, I'm too old to learn how to play an instrument, you know. Mm -hmm. So, and really using my, the techniques and skills that I have learned as an occupational therapist, mm -hmm. I know how to adapt the environment, adapt my tools, my teaching style to help to gear to this mm -hmm. person who really has that intrinsic motivation to want to learn how to play an instrument sure. and that would apply and I'm sure Edie would agree you know not just to piano but a variety of instruments as well mm -hmm. and one of my missions in life is to um, and I have uh, you know done extensive presentations on this topic mm -hmm. um, through the um, Music Teachers National Organization okay. and at Westminster Choir College and number Rutgers also a number of places really to get out there and to teach the music teachers that it's okay if somebody who might have you know um, some difficulty um, you know, comes into your studio mm -hmm. and wants to learn, and here are some techniques and tools to do that. Mm -hmm. um, I actually wrote a book on that topic as well, yes. so I really just kind of want to, you know, spread the knowledge and the mm -hmm. joy that, you know, even though somebody who might, you know, you know, might have a difficulty, they still might have that motivation to really, you know, to play music. Mm -hmm. And I know just from my own personal experience that a lot of times people with these more difficulties are more successful because they're, you know, they're just in it. You know, 100 percent, which sure. is great. Sure, know? they have an awareness that they need to try a little harder, and they really right. have. If they're going to accomplish this, they really have that determination within them, as you described. Right. Uh, you certainly do have a unique standpoint, being an occupational therapist and a musician, yes. and that you can bring those skills as an occupational therapist to your music teaching um, career, and right. also that you're able to share those skills now with other music teachers who don't have the advantage of having an occupational therapy background like you do, uh, in order to use those. Skills with clients who might have physical or uh, cognitive disabilities uh, that prevent them from learning the same way others do. Uh, what benefits have you seen in some of your students, um, you know, physically uh, with the, the playing of the piano? I mean, a variety of things. Um, 
You know, I just want to kind of say, you know, one thing people, you know, say when they have arthritis, I mm -hmm. can't play an instrument anymore. You know, sure. the doctor doesn't recommend it. Well, you know, y you can play an instrument. You certainly can. You just have to watch your, your hand position, mm -hmm. you know, to prevent, you know, carpal tunnel or other things. But really, I mean, thinking about it, you know, just that basic motion of playing, uh, you know, piano, playing the harp or any other kind of an instrument, you know, really improves your range of motion, mm -hmm. improves the lubrication and the, and the circulation of your joints, and, you know, would really be able to you know translate to other you know activities of daily living that mm. you might want to do so that's definitely one area sure. um, being able to to pay attention for a longer period of time yes. memory mm -hmm. frustration right. tolerance you mm -hmm. know when anybody learns an instrument you know you have to kind of you know work with that but the big thing that you know I really want to also get out there is the importance of linking to the community with the use of music mm. um, you know when you know a person retires or you know might have a condition yes. they might you know lose that role of being a worker mm -hmm. or you know being you know a caretaker of mm -hmm. a spouse mm -hmm. so music is a really great avenue to be able to you know to reach out to others sure. you know for example um, you know maybe a grandchild you know is learning how to play an instrument mm -hmm. so that person can then you know sit and play a duet sure maybe there's um, you like to sing and that your local church or other organization has a you know a choir mm -hmm. you can get out there mm -hmm. and sing and enjoy you can or if you're not if you're not musically talented but you know you like to <laughs> organize people you can organize a handbell choir or mm -hmm. those kind of things so it really helps to bridge and to give another role to a person who might be experiencing that that loss of a role sure sure so not only the the physical benefits of having uh, the ability to play something and maybe mm -hmm. feeling a little bit better as you expressed with the arthritis situation that someone might find their um, hands feel a little bit better doing other activities from playing the piano. They also get this exactly. added benefit of filling a role, perhaps, especially for a retired person who may have recently left employment and decided that they wanted to, uh, you know, take a break, but need something to fill that time or that exactly. that empty role. So certainly, we can see how music um, can play a, a variety of roles in our lives uh, from that point on. And certainly, we've already talked about how uh, listening to music and playing music are helpful. And Edie, you have uh, experience in both of those areas with uh -huh. the Bedside Heart Program. So. Why don't you let us know a little bit about how that got started? Uh, Bedside Harp is a college-based, hospital-hosted harp therapy program. Mm -hmm. When I started Bedside Harp uh, back in 2002 at Robert Wood Johnson University Hospital in Hamilton, nobody knew about harp therapy or how the harp was being used in healthcare. Mm -hmm. I've been a music teacher for over 40 years of my life, um, starting in piano and took uh, harp up in high school and college, mm -hmm. and the harps we played were concert grands, oh, wow. costing a, more than a car. <laughs> <laughs> so um, it was very exclusionary, and not a lot of people got to play the harp. Um, in 92, 93, uh, three people in my life died within a very short period of mm -hmm. time. And by the end of that, one of them was exactly my age in the 40s, in her 40s. And um, it makes you really kind of reassess uh, what's important in mm -hmm. your life. And I realized I hadn't touched a harp, played a harp, or really listened to a harp in 28 years, and that it was time for me to go back and recapture um, that wonderful feeling of mm -hmm. plucking the strings and making music on the harp, even though I was making music on the piano. I see the harp as being the heart of the piano because, mm -hmm. of course, it's, it's, it's inside every piano. Mm -hmm. And I thought I needed to do it to um, kind of recapture a dream. And I did, to a large extent, for the following six years. I took lessons with Elizabeth Hainan of the Philadelphia Orchestra and got to do some amazing things uh, with her and with the orchestra. And during this time, I began to realize how the harp was really healing me in more than one way. Mm -hmm. It was mo much more than just recapturing a lost dream. Uh, you hold it to your chest, and so the vibrations go right through your body. Mm -hmm. And that in itself is a very healing um, thing. Uh, you pluck each string individually as opposed to a piano where you touch a key and the key releases a damper and the hammer hits the strings. You're actually plucking the strings. So all of this 
is, um, is very, very healing. Mm -hmm. Not to mention the fact that the harp is the only instrument mentioned in the Bible in the context of healing. When mm -hmm. David played the harp for King Saul, when he would get into his states of being, and then later when David became king to comfort himself. So Robert Wood Johnson, University Hospital Hamilton, saw me play, and I always had my little brochure <laughs> at a health fair, and they were actively treating the anthrax infected postal employees mm -hmm. in October 01, yes. and they took me home with them. <laughs> and um, I had been rehearsing, if anybody would be interested, what I would say for two years, <laughs> and uh, they, they said, whatever you want to do, do it here. Wow. So um, very quickly, we um, started there and then grew. We're at seven hospitals, five of them in New Jersey. And we're, as I said, college-based at this point. Mm -hmm. So the center of our program is at hospitals to play for patients. And we play all over in the ER, in the ICU, um, all of the area, the NICU, we're mm -hmm. everywhere. Um, and then we uh, also teach people how to play the harp for their own healing and empowerment. Mm -hmm. And um, then we have a harp therapy program, which actually trains people who have learned how to play the harp to play mm -hmm. in healthcare. We train and certify them. Sure. That's, that's an amazing story, Edie, it really is. Uh, if someone were in a hospital um, that participated with the bedside harp program, does the patient request a harpist to come to their bedside? They can. Or, okay, or does they can, mm -hmm. but we also mostly stroll. Okay. We're wandering Drink minstrels. Stroll. We walk through the hallways, <laughs> and if a patient, you know, they catch our eye, we stop at a door. We're, mm -hmm. you know, we're, we, a person is in their most vulnerable state of being yes. in a hospital situation. Yes. So we just are there, and mm -hmm. if someone wants us, we are there. What a wonderful, wonderful thing to do. Um, what type of benefits have you experienced um, seeing in your patients who are able to listen to a harp at, as you described, their most vulnerable time? Well, you know, the staff at our hospitals already know what we can do. Mm -hmm. So I can step off of an elevator and a nurse will say, go into room seven. And I don't know what I'm going to, what's going to meet me in room seven, but I walk in and I may find a patient, for instance, hyperventilating, having problems breathing. I just play very slowly and softly, and within a few minutes, that patient is breathing like you and me. So that's pretty extraordinary. Yeah. When patients are, are uh, connected to monitors, you can really see how the music relaxes them. Mm -hmm. And Herbert Benson of the uh, Harvard Medical School uh, Mind Body Institute calls it the relaxation response. And um, meditation, it takes a while to kind of get to that place. Sure. But with music, it's instant. instant. That is a wonderful reward to see at the at the hospital since people are connected to these mm -hmm. monitoring devices, a, a direct impact in their, their blood pressure, their, their breathing, and those, those rates. Um, uh, from your story, I can tell that you personally experienced a lot of healing uh, from playing the harp. And Absolutely. so I think that's probably why you have teaching as, uh, as a part of what Bedside Harp does. Um, can you share with us some of the benefits that students get from, from learning the harp? We have taught since um, my first classes in June of 02. We have taught over 660 people to play the harp for their own healing, which boggles my mind. Yeah. Um, I, I haven't personally taught all of them. We now have <laughs> teachers that I've trained. Um, but 660 people, and about half of them had no music training in their backgrounds. Oh. Uh, and most of them are, our median age is 55 to 60. So this is, and what is exciting to me too is the fact that so many people come to learn to play the harp and say to me, you know, I always wanted to play this instrument. My family didn't have enough mm -hmm. money because they were so expensive mm -hmm. back then. Um, and I never got to do it and this is my turn now. Yes. So. It's, uh, it's really very rewarding to see how 
Bedside Harp has really opened the doors yeah. for so many people to realize that dream. Yeah, I think it goes directly to what Karen was telling us about with filling that role. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you're describing people who are maybe retired and, and looking for something to fill that role, and not only did that, but it fulfilled a lifelong thing that they wanted to do, but they were prohibited from doing because of cost or time or, or right. any, a number of those things. Well, many people start by saying, I'm just going to play for myself. I'm going to sit in my little room. I don't want even my husband to hear me play. <laughs> and these are the people who most often go on and become certified <laughs> to play in the health care. <laughs> Wonderful. So now that you mentioned that, um, so there is a certification required mm -hmm. for people who want to play the harp in a therapeutic way. Yes. Uh, and so um, you also provide that training to get to the certification. Yes, and that's college-based. Mm -hmm. And so even though it goes through uh, Bucks County Community College's mm -hmm. continuing ed department, uh, they award 12 college music credits for that, um, for that course yeah. uh, of study. It's pretty rigorous and intensive, but we're doing it with our hearts, so it, you know, it's, it's a labor of love. It sure is. <laughs> it sure is. Uh, and the um, HARP therapy uh, program, how is that? Is that that's not accessed? I take it through the hospitals. It's separate from the hospital program. Well, no, not really, because um, our ho the hospitals that host our programs are our incubators oh, for yes. our for our <laughs> interns. So um, they are required to have a certain number of classroom hours mm -hmm. and then a certain number of internship hours. And even we have uh, we have students now coming, believe it or not, from all over the world to study with us mm -hmm. and we encourage them to play at least some part if not all of their internship hours at our host at hospitals. hospitals. And then uh, they in turn do they go out in the community then and do the same services that you would at the hospital with people in their homes? Yes, many of them work in hospice, many of them work in um, you mm -hmm. know they we actually teach them be mm -hmm. to become entrepreneurs and oh, to sure. be able to um, find health care. I mean, health care and well, there's no place a harp isn't welcome, you know, from <laughs> from health care to boutiques to stores that want to, you know, have grand openings. Who doesn't want a harp? <laughs> <You know? laughs> well, since you've mentioned strolling with it and how much more accessible it is now, I understand you've brought one with you today. I have. And are going to play a little piece for us. I shall. And so we'll, uh, we'll make time for that. Um, at the end of the program. Uh, so we appreciate all three of you uh, taking the time out of your busy, busy schedules uh, to join us and tell us about all of these wonderful things that you're doing. Um, to, uh, since we've kind of moved along the, the thing, I'd like to, to go back to either of you. Have anything you'd like to add? Well, after? I think one of the things I want to add is that very often people will ask me, um, what can I do to improve my memory? Or how do I prevent memory loss? Mm -hmm. And there's two things about music that is very helpful with that. One thing is that they found that listening to classical music while you're trying to learn something makes it easier to learn mm -hmm. it. So I think that's a good hint. That For anyone who's going tip. back to school <laughs> and needs to study, that's mm -hmm. very helpful. And then the other thing is that um, we talk about people learning new things and, and so we say to people you know if you've played chess and you are an expert at chess and you keep playing chess that's not going to be as helpful as if you learn something new mm -hmm. so when you learn an instrument and you develop a new skill you're building um, better connections in your brain mm -hmm. that will help improve your memory so it's sure. very helpful yeah, it's, it certainly is. What great tips uh, for yeah. the folks at home to, to be able to know. Great. And uh, ladies, you any last thoughts before we go to our beautiful heart performance? <laughs> I think, I mean, you know, one of the most important things I think of is, you know, it doesn't have to be music, you know, but just, you know, get up and do something. Do what you love and love what you do, you know. Um, yeah, what a... What a, what a wonderful thing. It's true, you know. Uh, you know, some of the older folks that we've communicated with have said, you know, the key is to not stop moving. And I think that really is um, certainly um, one of the tips on, on a healthy aging is, is to just keep trying and keep doing those things. And so if it's the piano or the harp or <clears throat> just listening to music or learning something new, um, like an instrument, um, it certainly has many, many benefits to our overall health. So, again, I thank you all You're three welcome. for it's taking pleasure. the time uh, out of your schedule. And, uh, Edie, we're really looking forward to hearing your heart performance thank in you. a moment.
I would like to thank our guests for sharing their time with us today. Aging Insights is produced by the New Jersey Foundation for Aging. You can make donations to the foundation or sponsor an Aging Insights program by going to our website at www.njfoundationforaging.org or you can call us at the office at 609-421-0206. While you're at our website, please take a moment to fill out our new online survey about Aging Insights. We want to remind you about senior services in your area and to please contact your county office on aging, also known as the Aging and Disability Resource Connection in your county. You will see a listing of those numbers on our website or you can call the state hotline which is 1-877-222-3737. Thank you for watching this episode of Aging Insights and remember, aging is everyone's business.